you just don't understand. No, I understand perfectly well, I just don't agree, Scotty. If you really loved me, you'd let me do this. It's just sex, it won't affect our marriage in any way. If it does, it will only affect it for the better. I'm hearing about it now, Amber. Does it sound like I'm getting better? You're my husband, and I want us to grow old together. Why can't you be a good husband and let me do that? The problem is that I'm no longer your only husband, that's nonsense. No, it isn't. You have two husbands now. One you married, with whom you had children, with whom you shared income and expenses, with whom you shared your life, and to whom you now offer to give careless seconds instead of sex. Your second husband is your priority for sex, the one with whom you will share stories about how inadequate your husband by marriage is to justify his cheating. The problem your great marriage creates is that I am not okay with it. I don't remember you and Ralph, or whatever your lover's name is, being married at our wedding. That's ridiculous, you are my one and only husband. Tim is just an outlet for sex you can't provide. I'll never give you a sloppy second, I promise. Scotty, you're thinking too shallowly. You'd be surprised how many girlfriends we have who have a lover on the side, and their marriages are wonderful. You mean Danielle, who was on her third marriage? Amber, do you realize you're going to a whore to get permission to act like a whore? I wonder what she's going to advise you. You calling me and Danielle names isn't going to help. Look, I made a decision that I was going to do this. I deserve it after all these years of turning down men who were interested in me. I was faithful and content with my husband and equal partner in finances, parenting, and sex. Now that the kids are mostly taking care of themselves, it's time to reward myself for all the hard work I've done. A little sex on the side is very little after all. I provided for you and this family, and don't you dare threaten divorce. It will ruin you and your business, and the kids and I will get along just fine. You know, Amber, now that I think about it, your lover might not be so bad after all. I'll agree to your affair on one condition. What is that condition? I promise to fulfill it if it is possible. Oh, it is easily possible. In fact, it's simple. If you weren't already going to do it, please videotape your sex and give me a copy. What have you become, a pervert and want to watch your wife make love to another man? Why do you need a video? I just want to test your belief that everyone does it and there's nothing wrong with it. I plan to show it to our kids, send it to your parents, your siblings, our friends and neighbors, and those who are related to me and know me. I want to see if any of them are as trendy and modern thinking as you are. Well, you can just forget it, Buster. I'll meet my lover, and you won't get the pictures. You don't know where we'll meet, but it'll be somewhere you can't get pictures. If you just accept this, I'll have fun, and then I'll come home and we can get on with our lives without any damage. Scotty went upstairs and started packing while Amber stayed downstairs ranting. He came downstairs and said, go and meet your lover. I will get proof of your cheating whether you provide it or not. Oh no, you won't. As he left, he said to himself, she's in for a surprise when I show up in room 433 of the Holiday Inn Express tonight. I can't believe that idiot Tim texted her location. I just accidentally picked up her phone while she was in the bathroom. Amber knocked lightly on the door of room 433. She kept looking around the hallway for someone lurking nearby, but there was no one. The door was opened by Tim, dressed only in boxers. She slipped inside. I see someone's worried, she kissed him. I just don't want to waste a minute we have. Don't worry, it's just our first time tonight. I explained to my husband what we have to do, we'll have many more chances. How did he react? He was a little upset, I think he realizes he has no other reasonable choice. I'll be really nice to him in bed for a couple nights, and things will go back to normal, the new normal. There's something we need to do before we start. Scotty has threatened to find us and get proof of our connection. We need to check the room for cameras and microphones, just in case. They spent the next 15 minutes going over every detail of the room. Nothing was found. Amber took her time undressing in front of a naked Tim, lying on the bed with his head propped up and watching. Tim began his foreplay. Suddenly, 
There was a heavy thud at the door of their suite. What the hell was that? They both screamed. Tim cautiously approached the door. He looked out the peephole. There's a man lying on the carpet in the hallway. It looks like he's unconscious. Amber stood up and walked over to him. Let me take a look. After looking, she exclaimed, that's my husband, Scotty. My goodness, how did he know where we were? Tim suggested, maybe we should call 911. I think you hurt himself pretty bad trying to break down our door. No, wait, he probably just passed out. Scotty thinks we're in this room, but he hasn't actually seen us. If we leave before he wakes up, he won't be able to prove we were even here. Maybe that will make him not try to spy on us. You just want to leave him there? Sure, if he doesn't wake up soon, someone will find him and call for help. He'll probably only get a bad headache on top of his great humiliation. Amber and Tim quickly dressed and left. They had to step over his body to get out. Amber and Tim went to bed. Amber returned home, figuring Scotty would go back to the cheap hotel room he was staying in and take a few aspirin pills. She had brief but good memories of her time with Tim. She hoped she would dream of the next uninterrupted time spent with him. Around 2.38 a.m., the doorbell rang several times, and there was a heavy knock on the door. She threw on a robe and went to the door, looking out the peephole. She saw a sheriff deputy standing there. He looked old for an officer of the law, and his stomach was straining the buttons on his shirt. She partially opened the door and asked, Yes, what's up? Are you Amber Stevens? Yes, what's up? Your husband, Scott Stevens? Yes, has something happened to him? Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry to inform you that he's dead. What? Dad, that can't be true. How did that happen? She started to cry. Damn, I hate these calls. An old man close to retirement gets a shitload of responsibilities. I'm sorry for your loss, ma'am. I'm even more sorry that I have to ask you some questions. He was found dead in the hallway in front of room 433 at the Holiday Inn Express around midnight. I'm afraid you won't be able to see the body for a while, they're doing an autopsy. Autopsy? And he's suspicion of foul play results in an autopsy, that's the law. Foul play? Yes, people don't usually drop dead in a pool of blood of their own free will. Blood? There was no blood. Amber immediately realized she'd messed up. I mean, that means you just admitted you knew your husband was attacked when you didn't do it yourself. We had nothing to do with that. He ran into a door and passed out. I assume by we you mean you and Tim Grace? Yes, we were having a meeting in room 433 when Scotty tried to break down the door. He mistakenly thought we were doing something we shouldn't be doing. Look, lady, I'm not the morality police. I don't care what kind of meeting you had with Mr. Grace. Mr. Grace, as the man who rented room 433, has already been questioned and admitted to the sexual nature of your encounter. He even said that you informed him that your husband was consenting to you having sex with him. I'd say he was wrong in that assumption. Are you arresting me? Not at the moment. I'd like to arrest you for leaving your husband to die on the hallway floor, but I swear I thought he was only passed out. I didn't see any blood, I was sure you only had a bad headache. Never mind, I think there may be a charge for leaving a man in distress without notifying the proper authorities, but for now, I won't arrest you. You and Mr. Grace are, as we say, persons of interest in the case of Mr. Stevens's death. Don't leave town, I'm sure you'll be brought downtown for questioning after we get the autopsy results. You might want to consider hiring a lawyer, especially if the charge becomes murder. That night, Amber still couldn't sleep. She tried to call Tim, but his phone went to voicemail all seven times she tried. Later on Saturday morning, she made coffee when she realized she had brewed a full pot because she was used to making coffee for both herself and her husband. It came to her how lonely she was and would be without her husband. She was stunned at what she would have to do to keep her home and family together without Scotty. In addition to the funeral, she would have to pay all the bills around the house, deal with insurance, take out loans, and an unknown number of other legal issues. How will she be able to cope financially as a single parent? 
What if Tim and I were charged with murder? We didn't kill him, but innocent people are found guilty all the time. By leaving him without calling for help, we become guilty ourselves. The crying resumed with renewed vigor. She looked at her watch, it was close to 9 o'clock in the morning. It would be three hours before the children returned from their trip to their aunt and cousins. Scotty's sister, Beatrice, had two children close in age to their two children, they were like brother and sister, alternately loving and hating each other, but always wanting to be together. She wondered how she would be able to explain to them what happened to their father. The whole truth would devastate them and make them hate her forever. How will I be able to confront his sister and his parents? How will I confront my parents? How will I explain if they find out that I just left him to die? Why did I betray the best man I've ever known, just to get some mediocre sex? It was noon, and the kids still hadn't returned. She figured his parents had been informed, and they, in turn, had told their daughter that Scotty was dead. At least they won't know about my involvement in the case. Maybe his sister told the kids, but if that's the case, why didn't they call her? Why didn't her children want to come home to their mother during this difficult time? Surely they couldn't have known about her, Tim, and us leaving him there to die. After not hearing back from either the children or her sister-in-law's parents by 2 o'clock, Amber called on the phone. Hello? It was Beatrice, Scotty's sister. B, it's Amber. Did you hear? You have a lot of nerve calling here. Yes, we heard about my brother's death and your cheating. I could forgive your cheating, but leaving him to die in a pool of his own blood without calling an ambulance, what kind of sick person are you? B cried and continued, the children know he's dead and that you left him to die. They have explicitly told me that they don't want to come home to you, not now, not soon, and maybe not ever. I intend to keep them with me until they say they want to come home, or until a court orders that I must give them to you. I hope you'll be in jail until then, bitch. How could you know about what I did? Yeah, I'm married to the sheriff, or did you forget that when you forgot your marriage vows? B, I swear, I didn't, hello? She hung up. She called Tim several more times, to no avail. Amber had no one to turn on. She was seriously considering suicide. A bottle of vodka became her source of solace for the rest of the weekend. Amber ate little and drank a lot. The only task she completed was to go to the liquor store to get vodka. Monday morning, she called into work and said she was sick. Apparently, no one in the office had heard about Scotty's death. No one had said anything to her except, I hope you feel better soon. Amber tried to herself for that. Feel better soon? What about feeling better everywhere? I'm in the worst situation of my life, and it's all my fault. Around noon that Monday, the doorbell rang. It must be the police coming to question me, she thought. She opened the door and saw a young man carrying a package. I have a package for Amber Stevens. That's me. I'm sorry, miss, but I need to see some identification. I'll get in big trouble with my boss if I can't prove I gave the package to the right person. Amber went and pulled out her purse. She showed the young man her driver's license. He smiled, handed her the package, and said, you have been served. Enjoy the rest of your day. She opened the package. There was a statement of dissolution of marriage. Her first thought was that Scotty had started divorce proceedings before he died. There was also a letter inside. The envelope had her name on it. The letter was written in Scotty's handwriting. Inside, the letter read as follows, Amber, although I hate to cut you off from mourning, I'm not dead. I hope you were completely miserable, guilty, and ashamed of what you did to Tim and what you thought you did to me. I didn't plan for any of this to happen, but it accidentally turned out even better than I planned. That may seem like bragging on my part, but so what? Your idiot boyfriend texted you the location of your date. I saw it on your phone when you left it in the same room, heading to the bathroom as usual. That's how I found out where you were. My original plan was to break down the door and take pictures of the two of you to send out to our kids, my in-laws, your in-laws, your boss and co-workers, and everyone else I knew you knew. Then I was going to divorce you, no matter how bad the division of property was going to be. 
I learned that hotel doors are a lot harder to break down than the movies and cop shows on TV. I cracked my skull and passed out. No, there was no pool of blood, but I thought making you think that was a nice touch. Anyway, when I woke up, I saw that you two had already left, and probably figured I'd foiled my attempt to embarrass you. To I don't know if it was the bump on my head or what, but I had a fantastic idea. I called my brother-in-law, the sheriff, and told him about my idea. He said he couldn't use his actual deputies to help me, but he sent me up with a guy who had recently retired for a few bucks. The guy studied the script I gave him, put on his old uniform, and came to you. While he was meeting with you, I visited Tim with my Smith & Wesson friends and made him an offer he couldn't refuse. To talk to you. After a little coaxing, he confessed to what you two had done and were about to do. Coincidentally, I got it on a tape recorder. By the way, he probably won't be brave enough to contact you, at least not until the divorce is finalized. His balls should be healed by then. My sister liked my idea of revenge and played along. She told the kids that we asked her to keep them for a few more days, and to distract them, she arranged a trip to Holiday World. No worries, they never heard that I died or that you were a bad Samaritan. I still plan on telling them the truth about why we're getting divorced, if you don't, and I mean the whole truth. I'm not sure I should show them the tape. Maybe if they doubt we're telling them the truth. Yes, Amber, we're getting a divorce. No, you're not going to rape me in the divorce. Tim's confession is quite convincing and will, at the very least, make people think twice about you and your modern morals. So unless you want a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, to hear Tim's version of your cheating, you will accept my proposed equitable distribution of assets. Whatever you do, don't tell me you really didn't have sex. You cheated on me enough to divorce me as soon as you got the idea to screw him. Why didn't I just file for divorce? The first reason is that I needed leverage to get fair compensation after the hacking and getting the photos failed. I put on a dramatic show that involved you to get the leverage I needed. The second reason was revenge. I desperately wanted to hurt you badly for doing an act that ripped my heart out. I think I succeeded beyond my hopes. Amber, I loved you more than anyone in my life. You asked me to do something I could never do for you, share you with another man. You realize that now. You ended up getting caught and paying part of the price. Reduce your future misery and sign the papers. Your ex-husband, but never a cuckold, Scotty. Epilogue, Amber was a broken woman. She signed the papers, and in the months that followed, she faithfully allowed Scotty to take the children whenever he wished. She told the children the whole truth about what she had done. It took them a while to talk to her, much less forgive her. Father had never found a place big enough for them to stay more than a couple of nights, however, they had never felt as close to their mother as they had before her betrayal. She was always friendly to Scotty whenever she saw him and made sure to invite him to family celebrations such as birthdays, Thanksgiving, and Christmas anniversaries, which could have been celebrated if she hadn't gaffed. Instead, they became days of mourning. Amber even greeted Scotty when he brought a friend over a couple of times. Secretly, she prayed that he wouldn't develop a serious relationship with either of them. For her part, she no longer dated men or even flirted with them. On the second night after the divorce, Christmas Eve, presents were opened, and everyone seemed to forget about the past and acted like a family for a few hours. The kids said goodnight to daddy and went to bed before Scotty left. Amber asked him to stay for a cup of coffee. She said she wanted to talk to him about something. He agreed. After they had their coffee for a while, Amber spoke up. Thank you for coming today. It means a lot to the kids, and it means a lot to me too. Scotty, I never stopped loving you, even when I stumbled and destroyed our marriage and family. I want you to know that none of this is your fault, and I am so, so sorry. I know it's too little and too late on my part. I just wanted to make sure you knew. Amber, I loved you with all my heart. I couldn't believe you could want another man unless I did something wrong. Maybe it was something I did, maybe it was something I didn't do. What was it? I've spent the last couple of years trying to figure out what it might be. More hugs and kisses, more compliments, more frequency and variety of sexual positions, more random gifts of flowers and candy. 
I will not marry another woman until I have a plan ready to make sure she is always assured of my love. I will do this in the hope that she will not be tempted as you are. Scotty, there are many women who are more sensible than I am and would never make the mistake of betraying you. I hope you find her and regain the happiness we had but which I destroyed in our marriage. I still love you, and I hope you can accept that. That's a lie. The truth is, if you took me to bed right now, I wouldn't let you stop until I was dehydrated from being so thoroughly around. I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable, Amber. I could never marry you again. I may be able to learn to love you to some degree, but I can't replace respect and trust. I'll never trust you to fully respect me, and I know I'll always wonder what you're doing with someone when you're not with me. That's not the basis for a real marriage. Amber began to sob, lowering her head to avoid facing her ex-husband. But having sex until you're dehydrated is another matter. You're still the sexiest woman I've ever known. It would really help me to get a sexual release every now and then, so I don't risk my horniness leading me into a failed marriage. Amber looked up, happy eyes. She said nothing, took Scotty's hand, and led him into the bedroom that had been the site of many great lovemaking sessions in the past. That night, and in the years that followed, was a new classic night of sex. Don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, and if you're curious to see where this journey takes us next, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss a single update. Your support is what keeps this channel alive and kicking, and every like, comment, and share means the world to us. We've got plenty more stories, insights, and surprises coming your way, so stay tuned for the next video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.